Uh, okay, good afternoon, and uh, you know, thanks to the conveners for giving me a chance to speak about recent work I've done with uh, my colleague Richard Muller, and we're looking at uh, analysis of station data in China, you know, pollution patterns, and what can be derived from this data on the ground in particular. Uh, I suspect most people in here already know that China has a pollution problem. Uh, for context, this is a particularly bad day in Beijing, and there are a couple days like this in the typical year. Uh, we'll be focusing on the fine particulate matter, the you know, particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. Uh, so what has China been doing recently? In the last couple years, China has invoked, uh, embarked on an ambitious project of building out uh, air quality monitoring stations. They now have the second or third largest network in the world with 1,500 stations, about 900 of which are part of a national network, and the remaining one-third are part of uh, provincial-level administered networks. And as I said, most of this is just a few years old. Uh, what does this data look like? So for a couple days ago, here is the pollution data from, for China, Korea, and Japan uh, from AQICN. Uh, what you see is hazardous levels of pollution up in the Beijing area, unhealthy levels of pollution through most of eastern China, and much higher levels of pollution than you see in uh, Korea or Japan. Uh, so let's talk about what we're doing with this. This particular talk is going to discuss four months of data from the summer, uh, which we've gathered by scraping information from online aggregators. Uh, China, as far as we know, does not have a public archive of their concentrations, so you sort of have to collect it at the time it's reported. Uh, and we considered five pollutants, which I will focus on, uh, PM 2.5, this fine particulate matter, uh, because it has the largest health impacts. Uh, and we, so what we would do with this, we were looking at techniques for interpreting the ground data by itself. So in contrast to some of the fine talks this morning, which we're looking at satellite data or looking at station data plus a bunch of additional explainers, uh, we're looking at the station data sort of by itself to see what it can tell us. In particular, we look at the correlation structure between stations to help us understand spatial structure. There's a bunch of math here that relates to Krieging, which is the technique we used. And we're using an interpolation on each time step independently. Uh, so that gives us things that look like this. At the top is a time series of pollution in Beijing for four months I'm talking about here. I've indicated some red circles, and those correspond to the three maps at the bottom. Each of the little circles down here is a station, and the color inside the circle indicates the pollution concentration at that location. Uh, and over here I show you know, the color scheme. And behind the stations is our interpolated field using this Krieging technique, which gets an idea of what's the underlying spatial structure. What's one interpretation of what the underlying spatial structure could be, given these observations. Uh, I've colored this based on EPA health categories to give an idea of what this actually means. And in this particular example, we have a period of high pollution in Beijing that a few hours later is displaced by a wave of cleaner air from the north. And this is an example of the motion of these pollution patterns, which can be quite rapid, with you know, pollution moving hundreds of kilometers in a day. Uh, so I need to be able to click on something. Uh, so I have a little animation here. Hopefully it'll work. Yes? Uh, maybe? Yes. OK. Uh, so this is a brief clip of six months, uh, six weeks of analysis showing how when we do the interpolation at each hour and stack them up, what the patterns across China end up looking like. Uh, to give a little bit of background, prevailing winds in the north are west to east. In the south, they're weaker and east to west. So some of the pollution gets bottled up down here. In Beijing in particular, there tends to be a north, you know, a north, uh, south to north flow. It carries pollution upwards. Uh, but the main takeaway here is that the pollution is extensive. Uh, you know, if you believe all the station data and the connections between them. There's a lot of evolution on, you know, days to weeks time scale. Uh, and part of this is the 
the particulate matter tends to persist for several days at a time and can move substantial distances at that you know, time. Uh, so, you know, the lowest levels of pollution tend to be down in the southern coast. Uh, and in just a second here, I'll show you the average for the pollution across this map through time, actually through the entire four months rather than just through the uh, six weeks shown here. But, you know, this is getting an idea of what kind of patterns appear to be going on. Uh, and, uh, okay. So average pollution in China from this sort of built up interpolative analysis gives what many people would expect from satellites or other observations, that there is a pocket of you know, relatively worse air, uh, unhealthy pollution that extends from roughly Beijing to Shanghai as on average the worst air in China, though it, as the movies show it can move around quite a bit. And then there's an extensive field of somewhat, you know, still not healthy, but, you know, less unhealthy air that extends through most of China, and then the moderate air quality down near the coast. Uh, the populated, population weighted average exposure is 52 uh, micrograms per cubic meter in this four month analysis. Uh, the broad patterns are not limited to cities or basins. You know, there's a popular misconception among many of the people, you know, many of the common people in China that the haze is just bad where they are and not realizing the haze is really bad throughout most of the country uh, through extensive periods of time. Uh, and I mentioned that 46 percent of the population was exposed to, you know, the highest APA category, what's called hazardous air, at least once during this four-month interval. And 92 percent of the population had unhealthy air for a substantial length of time. Uh, I'll give this a little bit of context here. Uh, there's been a number of studies on the relative risk of air pollution, the mortality impacts. I'm going to give an example from one of them. This is the uh, Hoek et al. 2013 work. Uh, it's a meta-analysis of many studies, and it came to the conclusion that there's a 6 percent increased risk of mortality for every 10 micrograms uh, per meter cubed of air pollution you're exposed to for long periods of time. Uh, there's a large caveat here is that this is Western population studies almost entirely. Uh, there were a couple nice talks this morning that looked in this, uh, you know, that tried to get into the uh, Eastern, you know, into the developing countries. Uh, but assuming we're willing to take those numbers, the observed pollution concentrations that I showed you in the map a minute ago would translate to something like 1.5 to 2.8 million deaths per year, which is somewhat higher than previous estimates. And much of the difference has to do with how we're spatially uh, studying this. So we broke it down, both pre, uh, pollution and population at the prefecture level, whereas some of the other studies had looked at it more coarsely. Uh, I should also say that this is potentially an underestimate because we're looking at summer, which is among the cleanest times of year. Uh, on the other hand, we're still using Western risk estimates, which may not be entirely appropriate for China. Uh, so what else can be done with this data? So we have these pollution fields through time, and each time slice is independently estimated. So. One of the things we can do with this is compare adjacent hours, and after adding in some corrections for windborne transport and deposition, we can look at the differences in those maps to get an estimate of the source fluxes at different areas. Uh, you know, here's some math, math there too. Uh, so what do you end up with? So we end up finding that particulate matter, there's a band of heavy uh, emitters that's sort of the same Shanghai to Beijing region. Uh, where many of the heavy industry is, and many of these sorts of things. Uh, it's worth noting, though it doesn't look very, you know, impressive here. There's bands of sort of one microgram per meter cube per hour, uh, which in these units would be considered a heavy polluter in most parts of the world which are not China. So even though this doesn't look very impressive, these regions around Chengdu and Wuhan and some of these places in the south would be considered very substantial in other parts of the world. Uh, to blow up the Beijing to Shanghai corridor, where you have pollutions uh, up to five in these units, 
where the highest pollution is north of Handan, uh, nearly similar uh, high levels of pollution up at Tangshan. The center of Beijing is actually a somewhat transitional zone. Uh, it seems to be pulling a lot of the pollution from the uh, east and the south. Uh, okay. We also did this for other pollutants. Uh, this is SO2. The map is much sparser, which has to do with the characteristics of sulfur dioxide versus particulate matter. Uh, uh, but you can see large pools of sul uh, sulfur emissions, which are almost certainly related to coal burning in the absence of, you know, of effective scrubbing. If you have effective scrubbers, you can eliminate a large fraction of the sulfur. Uh, Beijing and also Chengdu, uh, Wuhan, there are many cities that show very sparse uh, or almost none sulfur emissions, which could mean they don't burn very much coal. We know Beijing has been moving their coal industry away, the Chinese have been moving their coal away from Beijing. Uh, but it also may mean that they're more reliable, robustly using scrubbers to reduce the emissions in some of these regions. It's a little hard to know, but there are definitely patterns that are probably related to coal burning. Uh, we also did nitrous oxide. Uh, nitrous oxide is generally associated with both power plants and automobiles, and we see nitrous oxide plumes in, uh, sorry, nitrogen dioxide plumes in places where we didn't see sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, such as Beijing and many of the other cities, where it may be associated with automobile activity or other things. Uh, so there's information here uh, that help, you know, helps characterize what are the underlying sources likely to be and what kinds of activities are going on in these locations. Uh, okay, so just to wrap up, give some conclusions. Uh, air pollution is not confined to cities or basins in China, but is widespread across populated areas. 40% uh, of the population breathes air that is, on average, unhealthy during this study period. Uh, the pollution levels imply something like four to 8,000 deaths a day, roughly 1.5 to 2.8 million deaths per year, assuming that the values we have here are roughly representative of the year as a whole. They probably are somewhat low. Uh, and assuming we can use Western mortality risk, which is probably not entirely fair, but we don't have a great alternative at the moment. Uh, so we're planning to extend this work to have additional time coverage in additional country, uh, countries and look at transport across the international borders. Uh, and you know, thank you for listening. I'll just put up the uh, sort of summary plots of concentration and flux. Thank you, Robert Rode. So we do have <laughs> we do have some time for questions, please. Uh, so there's a number of factors. One, there's different underlying population characteristics in terms of, uh, you know, obesity patterns, wealth patterns, access to health care. Uh, but there's also a uh, concern about nonlinearity. Most of the mortality risk studies have been done at concentrations like 10 micrograms per cubic meter, and China is five times higher than that. So you make extrapolations to that. And there's some debate in the literature whether you should really sort of sublinear or superlinear in terms of what your, the actual impact is. Uh, so we, you know, we can see the, you know, we see this aerosol, you know, the concentration is changing in the atmosphere. Uh, we can't directly tell whether it's a primary emission or a secondary emission, but we can look at sort of the other things that we measure, which is a limited list, you know, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, to the extent that some of that can be used to infer activity on the ground, we can make some of those inferences, but it's, it's going to be somewhat fuzzy.
Uh, it's certainly true. Uh, the answer is not well. Uh, we have to make assumptions that are fairly stationary at the moment. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, I'm sort of out of time, but yeah, we're, it's something we think about, but we don't really have a great answer to at the moment. 